Welcome to episode number 100 of the True Bud Show podcast. So let's go ahead and open a 100 milligram beverage. I felt like this is properly fitting because this is the first cannabis drink I ever had in my life. When I first moved out here, I think it was 2015 or 2016 when I got it. They've done some rebranding. This is a new flavor, but the original Cannabis Quencher I got at the Green Goddess Collective in Venice Beach was my first drink. And I actually got this from Green Goddess as well. So shout out Cannabis Quencher and shout out to the 100th episode of this show. It feels kind of crazy. Cheers, my friends. This is true buzz that Mary Jane. Now we ain't new to this. From my stones and from my cannabis enthusiasts. Never heard a show as good as this. Uh, number one, it's the best. Bringing in many special guests in the industry of cannabis. Business owners to grow us. Even artists you know of. So sit back and just roll up. Perfect show for my smokers. True buzz. Hey. Episode 100 is all about edibles. Let's get medicated, my friends. Let's read the True Buds table of contents for this podcast. Dispensary edibles we're going to talk about, gummies, baked goods, drinks, nanotechnology, how that has changed the edible game, homemade edibles and infusions, coconut oil, butter, alcohol, whatever infusions you like to do and what I've done in the past. How to make edibles with no smell. This is a question I get all the time and something that I used to actually care about when I was worried about smell. So this is a great topic and I'll probably clip that up and throw it on the True Buds TV channel. If you guys are just aware now, I have a whole other channel with tons of how to's. This is the podcast channel, but go check out True Buds TV if you haven't. Then we'll talk lecithin, lots of questions on that. I have a full video on that. Um, should you decarb? What is decarboxylation? We'll talk about that. Why should you make edibles? Or why shouldn't you make edibles? Do you need to decarboxylate? Should you? How should you do it? Is it necessary? All these questions I get, we're going to answer. What are some edibles that are being slept on for high dose and low dose consumers? I have some interesting takes on that and I'm excited for that topic in particular. Um, And then just where do we see the market going, man? So that's just a little breakdown, guys. Let's start out with the dispensary edibles. First and foremost, I would say the most popular edibles I see leaving the dispensaries are gummies. In particular, let's just throw out a couple freaking brands. Uh, Obviously, Wild, they're a top dog. So many people come in, people do Wild Wednesdays. But besides that, it's just a super popular gummy. And I ask people why they like it. And they say, it tastes good, it's consistent, it hits good. Um, We got Kiva Lost Farms gummies. They're live resin gummies. Um, Live rosin now, too, I saw. Um, Kana, solid gummy company. Those are at least... Let's just say that those are top three big dogs. You know, there's some others in there. I'm just going off the rip here. Um, Baked goods are not near as popular as gummies. Um, I think it's kind of, I think they're having like a resurgence a little bit, um, but they're the OGs, you know. Um, And I would say brands I've seen with the no bait, you know, with the baked goods, um, Big Pete's, um, Corova's, uh, Big Cookies, um, Canico, they do baked goods and granola bars. Um, but yes, yeah, it's just not as big of a t- uh, category. Drinks, my personal favorite category, or one of them in the edible realm. I love edibles. I love them all. I'm a big believer in kind of experimenting with everything and enjoying them all. But drinks, obviously. Cheers. And I've been selling cannabis beverages for a couple of years and I love them. And that brings me into the next point of the nanotechnology. Like, what is nanotechnology? I'm sure you guys have seen it if you've been in a dispensary buying gummies or you've probably just heard the term. So let me kind of just say it in my terms. I just say it how I think it is and it's pretty simplified, I think. Basically, you're just taking like, let's say the THC molecule that gets you high and breaking it down into smaller molecules or a smaller molecule that can be absorbed in your body. And this might not be the most perfect scientific terminology, but basically what you're doing is making that THC molecule or whatever cannabinoid, terpenes or whatever, act like another molecule, let's just say a water molecule. So therefore, that molecule can be transported through your body differently than a typical edible. So let's say I drink this. This is nanotechnology here. This is made by Vertosa. So, or the emulsion is at least. So I take that. I sipped it slowly. I got on the lips, a little absorption into the tongue. Um, The glands, the esophagus is starting to be absorbed too through the bloodstream. Some is still going to make it into the liver. And let's just address that there. 
the typical thing that, or the process that happens to get you high is your liver will take the delta-9 THC and convert it into hydroxy-11, which is that high, that edible high that a lot of people know and it's kind of thought of to be like a super hard sedative high. That's where nanotechnology and beverage in particular can provide that type of high or you can just like kind of sip and go with the flow. That's the beauty of the nanotechnology. So I see this being a huge thing in the game. I mean, I think we're going to see some interesting products down the line that utilize this, um, or they already are, but like utilizing both in conjunction. Um, I also think that for me personally, if I had an option to buy a nano versus non-nano at the same price point, I'd buy nano just because I'm like, I'd want it to kick in quicker. Why not? Now, one of my favorite video categories, and actually probably the most popular on my True Buds TV channel, homemade edibles and infusions. Let's go through the list here. I'd say the most popular in general that people like is coconut oil, followed closely by butter. Now, let's just talk about coconut oil for a second. I've been using more of the MCT or like the liquid coconut oil lately. Um, unrefined organic coconut oil is always recommended. It's always better to do quality in my mind, no matter what you're infusing whether it's coconut oil, whether it's butter, whether it's olive oil, my thought is why not spend a little extra on quality? It's going to be batched out. Like why not do the little extra, but also to each their own. Um, and then we have butter. Um, I prefer, like I said, quality. Kerrygold's my go-to. Um, you can buy clarified butter or you can clarify it yourself. I do this about I don't know, half the time, 60% of the time, um, clar clarifying the butter will give you a more potent product because essentially what you're doing is burning off the milk fats. So you're left with more of the saturated fats, which helps the cannabinoids in your infusion bind better. Um, it does kind of change the flavor. I'd say it makes it a little more rich, but there's also a little hack I like to do. I've showed you guys in my videos, if you've seen them, is the milk fats that burn off. Usually when I do do that, um, clarify my butter. I will um, keep the milk fats in the pan, then I'll cook some pasta and mix it in with some fresh butter and those fats. It's like a nice creamy pasta. It's so good, guys. I'm just a foodie and I'm ranting. Um, alcohol tinctures, I think, are slept on um, or infusions in general because you can just take your weed, decarboxylate it or not, and throw in alcohol, let it sit for however long you want, and take it out, and it's good to get you high. But basically the best way to do it, which like Rick Simpson oil is made, is you boil that off or just let the air dissipate off. I don't know if you've ever left anything with alcohol in the open and you, for a couple days and you come back and it's really lost, you know, that amount just burns off in the atmosphere. Uh, by honey, honey's a interesting infusion. There's all these other ones. I want to start doing like more milk stuff is interesting. I've gotten some recent milk products and just like recently that are good, but it's an interesting method. I'm going to do a powdered cannabis uh, infusion, but let's move on to the next topic, which is asked about so much. How to make edibles with no smell, my friends. Let me tell you how I would personally do it. And this is something I used to worry about more when I actually had to worry more about the smell. But here's what I would do. I would get a mason jar. I would take, let's just say we're using an ounce. I'd take my ounce. I'd put it in the mason jar. I would put it in the oven to decarboxylate it. I would do 220 degrees for about 40 minutes or so. You could do 240 for 20 or 30. Find what works for you. I keep preaching that. It's all about what you want. So you decarb it. There's going to be no smell coming out because it's a sealed mason jar. Take that jar, bring it outside, bring it somewhere far away, open it up because you're going to get a fat freaking loft, a fat smell. Add your oil to it, seal it back up, go back in put it in a double broiler. So just fill a pot with water, add the mason jar on like low, slightly above low, maybe let it infuse, swirl, swirl it every couple hours and you're good to go. I mean, make sure when you open that up again, when the infusion's done after you're done, drain it, strain it um, outside somewhere if you're worried about smell, put it back in the jar and you're all good. That's what I would do. You can also use a sous vide instead of the mason jar is a nice way to do that, but mason jars is easiest, cheapest. I'm trying to tell you the cheapest, easiest way to do this, which I imagine most of you want to hear. Um, also the devices I use, like the Levo C, the Levo 2, a magical butter, they have a reduced smell for sure, but there still is some smell with 
that process of the decarboxylation and the infusion. So that's my little tip of how to do that. Um, and a pro tip I like to do, no matter what I'm infusing, I like to like, I'm a huge garlic fan in general, but whatever you like to cook, maybe have a meal going. But what I like to do is get a little pan, put olive oil in there, fresh garlic cloves, put it on low, let it simmer, let that garlic smell permeate your residence and you're good to go. Lecithin, lecithin, lecithin. So many people comment on this channel about lecithin, like, bro, you didn't put the lecithin in. Do you need lecithin? What, what's it for? You do not need it. Once again, so much when it comes to edibles is a personal preference. Basically what lecithin is gonna do is allow your product, your, you know, let's just, well, let's just say a butter for now. It's gonna allow everything to be more evenly bound so you're not left with like certain areas of your infusion with like other more potency. So it allows for a smoother mixture throughout. It al allows for a longer shelf life, more stability in general. And it does help the bioavailability of the edible within your, like when you're consuming it. However, it doesn't make it more potent because some people think that. It just allows a little bioavailability, like just to be more, to be a better uptake within your system. Sorry, I was just trying to think of a nice way to say that. But once again, everybody's different. And I also talked to like a bunch of chefs on this podcast who don't like decarbing and they don't like using lecithin. They would prefer to have more terpenes and a more rounded product um, than, the, um, and then they don't want the flavor of like a sunflower or soy lecithin, especially if they're cooking intricate dishes. So once again, the biggest thing I can stress is what do you want? The only way I'd say you should definitely use it, if you're like, dude, I want to keep this oil or this butter for a while, definitely throw some less than in, and you're good. <sighs> now you might be sitting there like, bro, I've heard you say decarb or decarboxylation so many times. What is that exactly? I have a whole video I'll link below, but let me tell you here briefly. Decarboxylation is basically the process of activating your THC. So when the nug is there by itself or the shake you've ground up has um, THCA in there, then when you put it in the oven or your heating source, it's activating that to turn it into the psychoactive THC. The most common thing I've seen is people putting it in the oven for about 200, for about 30 minutes at 240 degrees. Some people do 40 minutes. Sometimes I'll do 240 for 20. Sometimes I'll do 220 degrees for 30 or 40 minutes. I feel like that burns off a little less terpenes. Um, sometimes I'll do half a batch decarb, half not to increase the terpenes as well as the THC count. So you don't have to. Once again, let me bring up the chefs. Most chefs I've talked to do not like to because it brings out more flavors. You can taste the actual fresh herb more, but not only that, you're left with more of the entourage effect because we have to remember, just think about it. There's so many more cannabinoids in the plant besides the common ones that we think about, THC, CBD, CBN, CBG, uh, THCA. I mean, I could keep going and there's so many more to be found out. You know, I, I Delta 8's a hot one right now. THCO is interesting. I've seen a lot of backlash with that recently. But it's just, it's just something to think about, guys. I'm a big believer in that and just life in general. Do what like you want to do with your infusions. If you watch this video and you're not feeling it, then don't do it. But if you're oh, that was a cool idea he had with like, maybe I will do half and half. Like, that's what this is about to me. Um, why should you make edibles? Or why shouldn't you? This is interesting to me. This is an interesting topic. I'd say like, you should make edibles for number one reason is to save money and have control over what you're making. Number one reason. Um, and you can make them super potent, but I'd say that's the main reasons why you shouldn't buy animals. I'd say if you don't consume that often or you don't have anything to test your infusions or you just want something that's a little tastier, or just quick little hit, like seriously, like you can go to the store, buy like Kiva Petra Mints, 2.5 milligrams a piece for the mints. It's a 250 milligram package, I believe. Um, and that lasts you so long and it's quality. So like, I would say, edibles are worth making for me personally to save money as well as like show people that hey you can do this like I want to lower the barrier to entry to this shit because as much as I love dispensaries and love the way products are coming along in the game and I believe I'm at the forefront of that with the beverage space and the edibles and pushing that forward but I'm also a big fan of helping people who can't you know 
afford that are people who don't have an option to go to a dispensary or get a delivery service. So that to me is a truly important thing about this channel and I get a lot of good feedback on that. So I hope you guys like these edible videos I do. I do them, you know, to enjoy it. And I need to give more to friends and stuff. I'm thinking a lot more lately, but like it's also just to give back to you guys and show you it's a learning process. Maybe you can learn a little bit from me, my mistakes I've done in videos, so you don't have to get those mistakes when in your infusions. And if you have a good idea, let me know. I've learned some good shit from everybody watching this channel, so thank you. What are some edibles that are being slept on for high dose and low dose consumers? I think, let's start low dose. I think things that are being slept on for low dose consumers are beverages. The, the, the microdose beverage. And some people may say they're not being slept on. A lot of that's like the entry point for a lot of people. And I agree with that. However, I see a lot of people coming in to dispensaries buying five milligram gummies. And they're not aware a lot of times that there's these other form factors out there that could be just as nice or even better. So that's a pretty interesting thought for me. So I'd, I'd say beverages and just like little microdose gummies and mints. And I think there's a huge play in like in that uh, market itself, but I think another part of this conversation that has me more excited because it's more just who I am is the high dose component. Like, what are people sleeping on with the high dose? I see so many people going in the shops wanting to get a hundred milligram gummy that's the cheapest or some shit, a hundred milligrams or whatever it is they just want it cheap, and they just want to eat it like an edible and be good. But I'm like, yo, you're paying like still 15, 20 bucks for that where you could buy some of these like tablets or in particular FSO, RSO, FSO, full spectrum oils, uh, becoming more of a popular term. RSO is the original Rick Simpson oil. And his whole story is amazing. I've actually started to do a video and I'm gonna do like a little mini doc on him and what he did is insane and it's so amazing. But that's what I think. I see these people coming in and they're like, oh, I just want a cheap 100 milligram edible. And I'm thinking in my head, bro, you could buy this like, um, let's just say Friendly Farms FSO tube for like 30 bucks and that has like 800 more milligrams in there and you could literally throw that in a little like gel cap or you could infuse your own gummy so I think we're going to see a big or I'd like to see more talk about that um, in the dispensaries and you know not the hate on the gummy market it's not a hate thing at all I'm just trying to help people who might need something more medicinally or just need a higher dose and as you guys know I love smoking for fun and recreationally but i actually do take it medicinally i don't know if you know that like i have a couple like things with me little tweaks like not as much anymore i still work out a fair amount but i used to play sports all the time i plant a flesh itis my flat feet hurt so much like i literally get home from practice i couldn't walk and that was before my smoking days and then i started smoking later it helped out but now more so it's every now and then i have a couple fused discs in my lower back and i'll throw that shit out and i just need like a heavy edible something and this like RSO is super nice or and I'll just lay on the hard floor of my carpet and relax and there's really something beautiful about that and I just think that maybe people are scared or they just don't know about it I think and that's what I realize is such an interesting thing especially being in the beverage space is that there's such an education that needs to go on I talk to so many people that literally literally this isn't even like funny don't know what they're taking I'm, I'm like, do you know what's in there? They're like, uh, no. I'm like, well, okay, let me tell you about it. And I always like asking questions. I always like, er like learning. Because you guys have to understand, I'm in these stores. I'm doing these events. I'm selling koans. So like, if I push the sale and they don't like it, I'm like, hey, you know, I do a soft sell. Hey, try it for a party. Enjoy it later. It always makes this. Maybe do it here, here, whatever the sell is. But then I ask them, hey, if you don't mind me asking, like, what are you grabbing today? And that's where I gain so much of my insights, just being on the ground floor level at these dispensaries across California, seeing this, asking just your everyday people questions about why they like weed, what they're getting, what they're seeing. And that's where I formulate a lot of my opinions. Where do I see the edible category going as a whole, you ask? Why? To the moon, my dear friend, to the moon. For real though, I see this category as already a huge one, but as more, people learn about it and you know who said it really well actually I had him on podcast podcast a couple weeks ago was um, Abe Miller um, VP of sales for Uncle Arnie's one of the founders and he was talking about the edible category as a whole I'll, I'll clip that or I'll put that clipped video below or the whole podcast and he was just saying like 
hey man, we got to look at this as a whole category. So when somebody comes in and says, I want this edible, it's not instantly a gummy. It's like, oh, maybe they can drink it. Maybe they can eat a cookie. Maybe they can eat a gummy. Like understanding that there's all these other options out there. Like I was saying, even with the RSO and these tablets and stuff and seeing the category is a much broader category because I feel like right now it's almost just seen as edible, gummy. Like that's changing and um, I want to be at the forefront of that. That's a wrap on episode 100. It's crazy. I've done a hundred of these. Well, not solo with homies here. And that's why I did it was to learn, have fun and just build this community. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being part of it. And if you want to be part of it more, hit me up. Like you can hop on the pod. Like uh, I'm doing Thirsty Thursday videos. You want me to make you a cannabis cocktail? Holla at your boy. Like roll through the in-home studio. Like kick it. That's what it's all about. I want to keep building this. This year is huge. I'm telling you 2023 is the year. I'm also putting it out to you guys. I put it out to my friends and family. But like this is the year that True Buds is popping. This is the year for me, for Jack. Like this is the year for you. And I appreciate you even like letting me put this out like that and listen to it right now because that's what it's all about. I know you heard it. Helps me even go fucking harder. So thank you. 2023 is our year. And I'll catch you on the next pod, my homie. Peace.